Welcome to the Improving Development Evaluation Podcast. I'm your host, David Wand, and welcome to Episode 1, Part 2, where we feature Care Canada as our international development organization. Before I introduce you to our two evaluation experts, I'm going to give you a brief synopsis of what I've done with Part 1. On October 19th, I sent to Care Canada by email Part 1 of this episode, explaining my critique of their performance measurement framework. And then on October 20th, I followed up with a phone call to make sure they had received the email. And then I followed up again on October 30th with a repeat email reminding them of the invitation to attend the podcast. It's now November 6th. We have not received a reply from Care Canada regarding whether to attend. And we have not received a written response, which was another option for them. If they were unable to attend, they could send a written response to the critique of their performance measurement framework. To be fair to Care Canada, today it's 7 a.m. Ottawa time, where Care Canada is located. That's a bit early in the morning. But they could have sent a written response, but we haven't heard anything from them. So now we're going to proceed and go into more detail about the outcome indicators and why they're flawed in their performance measurement framework. From Georgetown, Guyana, I have Donald Cole. Donald Cole holds a Master's of Science degree in Data Engineering from Edinburgh Napier University and is a Monitoring and Evaluation Specialist. And we also have from Kampala, Uganda, Dr. Mark Degner, who holds a PhD in Social and Economic Science from Carl Franzen's University in Austria. And he is currently a Technical Advisor in Advocacy, Communication, and Documentation. So what we're going to do now is we're going to go through the outcomes. So let's start. I'll read out the outcome. And then, Donald, you can talk about the outcome indicator and why it's flawed and even, if you wish, to provide an alternative indicator. So beginning with the first outcome in the project, increased entrepreneurship capacity of women-led grassroots social enterprises to pursue economic opportunities in Vietnam. That's the outcome and the outcome indicator. Yes, the outcome indicator for that particular outcome is number of women led grassroots social enterprises reported increased capacity to engage in entrepreneurship opportunities in Vietnam. So this particular indicator, there's like three main points I would like to highlight. For this indicator, the first one is the vagueness in increased capacity. The term increased capacity is is vague and it does not really specify what aspects of capacity are being measured. The second point is its reliance on self-reporting. And that data can be very biased because, you know, self-reporting data persons tend to be very biased in terms of how they report and provide feedback. And the, the third key point on this indicator is the lack of objective measures. There are no objective measures for entrepreneurship capacity or, or success. In terms of improving this particular indicator, the first thing would be, would need to be done is to have a clear definition, obviously, of what capacity entails, whether it entails business skills, access to capital, market access, et cetera. The second thing that would be need to address is the objective matrix of the indicator. What are the objective matrix are we going to measure? Are we measuring revenue growth, employment rates, number of new businesses started, and so forth? Uh, the third thing that would need to be addressed is periodic and independent assessments. Conduct periodic assessments, and these assessments should be done by independent evaluators to ensure that they measure the growth and the sustainability of the enterprises. And then uh, there's an issue with confidence versus competence. Um, while confidence is important, it should be measured alongside uh, competence, especially when it comes to uh, entrepreneurship skills. That would be my brief critique of this particular indicator and ways in which this indicator can be improved. I didn't come up with a um, a rewarded indicator because I think I would probably need a bit more information, but those key points would definitely address the issues with this particular indicator. That's excellent, Donald. Thank you. So we'll move on to the next outcome statement in the 
performance measurement framework for this project by Care Canada, delivered in Vietnam. That's increased gender responsive capacity of poor, rural, and ethnic minorities, especially women, to save, borrow money to support productive and sustainable economic activities in Vietnam. And the indicator I'll be looking at there is percent and number targeted poor, rural, and ethnic minority women and men who report an improvement in capacity to save money. And I have the same issue that Donald's explained is increased gender responsive capacity to save and borrow money. They're depending here again on self-reporting. So you have this self-reporting uh, bias or what some people call social desirability bias, where uh, they're, they're ha they will have a tendency to want to say, yes, we've increased our capacity. And uh, another point is, if they have the capacity to save money, and borrow money, why not just check out their bank accounts? Why not just go right to the chase? How, uh, now, some people may say that's intrusive, but if they really want to show that they've been able to save and borrow money, they should look at their savings accounts. And their ability to borrow in, implies the ability to pay back a loan on time. So they could also use that as an alternate way of measuring their capacity. And also, as we allude to in the trailer of this uh, podcast, even if their capacity is properly measured, and it is not here, but let's assume it is, how do we know it's the project training that was responsible for this increase in gender responsive capacity to save and borrow money? There could be another group of women in another part of Vietnam who are also doing this just fine, and there's no project training going on. They figured it out all by themselves. So that's what my points would be for that. Now, the next indicator is... 1210.1. So that would be Donald again. This is where we have the outcome increased gender responsive capacity of poor rural and ethnic minorities, especially women, to earn income from climate smart and sustainable on farm and off farm livelihoods in Vietnam. Donald? Sure. Thanks, David. This particular indicator that supports that outcome is percent and number. Targeted poor, rural, and ethnic minority women and men who report an improvement in their capacity to earn income. And this indicator is disaggregated by sex, ethnicity, age, disability status. Three main issues again with this indicator. The first one, again, same issue like the last two indicators. It's based on self-reported improvements, which may not reflect actual income changes. Uh, the second issue I have with this indicator is the frequency of measurement. It's, it's unclear how often this measurement is taken, which can affect the reliability of, of the data being collected. And then there's no comparison group. It's difficult to attribute any improvements to the project, specifically if you don't have a comparison group. How this indicator would need to be improved to, to measure the impact project is uh, the first thing that would be need to address is, you know, having that control group being selected and, and that control group should be matched on key demographic and socioeconomic so variables to ensure compart compartability and implement statistical techniques, you know, such as propensity score matching can be used, for example, uh, to select a control group that mirrors the intervention group as closely as possible. The second thing is the frequency of the data. Determine an optimal data collection frequency that balances the need for the timely data with the logistical constraints of data collection. This may involve seasonal assessment to account for agricultural or market cycles that affect income. And then there's income measurement. A, a comprehensive income measurement tool would need to to capture not only the amount of income, but also sources and stability of that income. And this tool should be sensitive enough to detect changes over time and attributable to specific project interventions. Uh, and the fourth thing I would suggest that would need to be considered for this indicator for improvement is you know, link the specific activities to income improvement, to specify project activities, to identify what exactly is, is really working. 
So the next outcome is increased willingness of poor, rural, and ethnic minority women and men, duty bearers in particular, commune officers, to address the issue of women's unequal caregiving burden and economic rights in Vietnam. And I think, Donald, you're looking at the indicator there. Yes, that, that particular indicator states Average score of ethnic minority men and women, duty bearers in particular, community officers who report gender equitably attitudes. And this is disaggregated by sex, ethnicity, age, disability status, type of participant. I have three main issues with this particular indicator. The first one is the subjectivity of it. This card indicators relies again on self-reported measures of attitudes, and this can be highly, and in more cases are very highly subjective and influenced by social desirability biases. The second issue I have with this indicator is the lack of baseline and follow-up. Without a baseline measure or regular follow-up, it's very difficult to assess whether any changes in attitudes um, are due um, to the project or, you know, the activities coming out of the project. And there's no actionable outcome. Porting an attitude does not necessarily translate into act actionable change or improvement in gender e equality. Let me just ask you, Donald, that's correct. But in this outcome, to be fair to Care Canada, they just want to make sure that the attitude has changed in the right direction, increased willingness. So you mentioned lack of frequency in measuring this attitude change. If we have a chance, we can look at the performance measurement framework. What exactly is the, the frequency they measure this attitude change? Does it say in the performance measurement framework? I think they mentioned outcome harvesting and it might be annual reporting. Let's check to make sure. I, I'm quite sure the frequency is not enough, but here it is. Yeah, you're right. It's outcome harvesting. And it's only done annually. So that means you get an attitude change, you get it in the right direction, but they only measure it once a year. So there's all sorts of different things that could be going on that could change their attitude that's got nothing to do with the project. Yeah. So, yeah, that's a good point. Yeah. Yeah. So suggestions on how this could be improved is, yeah, definitely, first of all, addressing the regular assessments, right? So implement more pre-project surveys to you know, establish a baseline, conduct regular follow-up surveys to track changes over time. They could also use a comparison group where people that are not in the project, that are not, they're not d doing anything to any of these women or this target group to change their attitudes. They could also measure their attitudes on the same variable, which is increased willingness to particularly these commune officers to address the issue of women's unequal caregiving burden. And they could go to other districts in Vietnam and ask commune officers there where Care Canada is not working and trying to change their attitudes. Their attitudes could also be going in the right direction. Right. Right. Yeah. One of that's a, that's a key point. Um, and one of the methodologies I have here to note that would, you know, expand on, on the, the technical assessments of this, of this particular indicator is one, they can also implement a longitudinal study design methodology, you know, that measures attitude over multiple time points. And this would, this would allow for assessments of changes in attitudes and the sustainability of these changes uh, over time. Another thing that they can do is implement a mixed method approach where they incorporate qualitative uh, methods such as focus group discussions or in-depth interviews. And that is complemented with the quantitative self-reporting data. And that would provide a bit more context to the attitudes expressed and the reason behind any changes or lack of any changes thereof. Yeah, that's right. There's, there's a common problem where focus groups are used just to measure the outcome indicator rather than measuring the outcome indicator first and then seeing that the outcome indicator is not moving in the right direction. And then, and only then, should they have a focus group where they ask the question, hello, why did your increased willingness not go up? 
And then you hold a focus group to find out. But often focus groups are abused, misused, and they only use them like outcome harvesting to try to measure the outcome indicator in the first place. Yeah. Right. Correct. Okay. So let's move on to the next outcome, which is increased ability of ethnic minority women to meaningfully participate and make decisions related to economic activities at the household level and in their livelihoods. And Mark, I think you're going to be dealing with 1120.1 indicator. Well, yes, I'm reading a percentage and number of ethnic minority women who have meaningfully participated in economic decision-making in the household. Yes, I think general increased ability participation are, are difficult terms to evaluate and also to monitor because meaningfully participation, what, what does it mean in detail? Yeah, is, uh, it, does it mean that they have not the chance to participate in the household before? Is there because of what? Because of cultural aspects or social aspects? And now if they are able to do this, it's, he can maybe, this is for me also a question of a qualitative approach necessary, a question of qualitative measurement and uh, in general decision-making you have to go back and ask them maybe in interview situations, what has, what has improved your participation in the house or is the husband now allowing you or is your role in the family has been stronger than before? to explain this indicator and the other way is sometimes the stories of change can also help to get, to verify and to find out if there, what is now the improvement in the situation. And the second one is uh, similar. It's the percentage and numbers of ethnic minority women who report participating and voicing out their concerns about paid economic activities to local authorities and TTPRs. Yeah. Here we have a similar situation. It, there's one aspect with certain women who report, they're reporting their participating, participation and, and voicing out their concern. So it's a self-reporting or it's a, it's a reporting that happens via a, a survey. I don't know, but Mike, for me, it's what I, when I look at this, I think what is what uh, local authorities are they? What type of duty bearers are, are these who are concerning about this? Are they from the, from the district, from the, from the communities? And how can they see the improvement to the situation before? Yeah. It is, it's a little bit uh, a tricky to use such indicators who are, you can use your qualitative approaches to, but end of the day, it's to see the change yeah? Yeah, from the baseline to the target, it's sometimes not so, not, not so visible and also hard to measure it. Yeah. Right. And if you look at the outcome, it's, it says we've bolded it for, for if anybody's interested in getting the performance measurement framework, you just email me. It says increased ability to meaningfully participate. Now you could argue, you can measure that quantitatively. You could, you could measure their ability to negotiate or whatever. You could, you could test them. You could do some sort of assessment before, during, and after the training instead of self-reporting. So that's a really quick way of arguing. You could actually objectively measure increased ability based on some sort of training where they're training them how to negotiate for, for better participation in the household. And that would be good enough because the outcome is clear. It just says, Increased ability. After that, good luck. We don't know if that's going to lead to greater levels of satisfaction for these women in the household, but at least that piece, that short-term piece in the, in the immediate outcome of increased ability, they could measure it, but they're going straight to stories of change. And to be fair to Care Canada, of course, they're doing what Mark has explained, which is trying to find out how to measure this level of participation in a household, which is very difficult. It's intrusive. So we understand stories of change may be a way of doing it, but you've forgotten your outcome in the first place. 
which is increased ability. So they've kind of missed, in my opinion, that first step where they could actually measure their ability using some sort of psychometric test of their skills to be able to negotiate based on training they have received in the project. And then you could also do this with another group of women who are not even in the project or in some other part of the country, and that would be good enough. They could show that ability has actually increased. Yeah. yeah the, the, the other question is also when, when you talk about household, yeah, then you have also to ask the other members of the household, yeah, the, the husband, the children, or people who live in this household, if the if economic decision-making has been improved because of the project. Yeah. So it, you, you need more voices to understand what is really the improvement. Even though they've made it clear in that second indicator, they only are interested in the women. But it's a good point is that it's a, a more complex dynamic in, in the decision making within the household. But they say right in the, at least I give them credit for specifying, it's the ethnic minority women. They want to increase their participation. But you're right, it, it may depend on the other members in the household. Absolutely, yeah. Okay, so we're going to move on to the next outcome, which is in the performance measure framework, increased capacity of civil society organizations, including women's rights organizations, private sector companies, and media organizations to promote poor rural and ethnic minority women's economic rights in Vietnam. In the indicator, number of civil society organizations, media organizations, and network members, private sector companies, who report an improvement in their perception, opinion, related to ethnic minority women's economic rights. So again, outcome is clear, increased capacity. So that means we should be looking at their ability, increased ability to actually advocate for these women regarding their economic rights. So there's a huge bias in here because these organizations are paid for by Care Canada, by the project to advocate for these women. So they're expected to advocate on their behalf. So if you ask them, have you improved your ability or your perception or opinion related to women's economic rights that you happen to be paid for by the project to advocate? Of course, they're going to say yes. So this is a huge bias. And again, they missed the point of the outcome, which is they should be just measuring their increased capacity to advocate. There's all sorts of projects where they train people on how to advocate for another group, which is what's going on here in this outcome. So that's the major problem I see with that. And I pointed it out. Why not objectively measure? Uh, and also the other point is it's not the institutions, it's the human beings inside of them that we need to look at. We need to measure their technical capacity to advocate for others, right? So it's not just the number. That's the real problem here. The indicator says the number of organizations. So you just tick a box off. How do you tick that box off that says this civil society organization in Vietnam has met all our criteria, criteria of adequately and increasingly in better ways advocating for these women? How do we know? So what we need to do instead is go inside that organization and test a group of the individuals who are expected to advocate for those women. I think it could be even duty bearers. I'm not sure and make sure that their technical ability to advocate has gone up and maybe even their attitudes have gone up. And then the other problem, of course, is even if they have gone up, there may be another group of civil society organizations that are doing just as good a job or even better job at advocating for ethnic minority women's economic rights in some other part of the country where Care Canada is not involved at all. So that, that's the problem with that indicator there. Now we'll move on to the next outcome, which is increased participation by poor and ethnic minority women in paid economic activities. I think, Mark, you're doing this indicator here. Yes. Percentage and number targeted poor, rural, and ethnic minority women and men who report access to and control over economic resources. These are graded by sex, ethnicity, age, disability status and commune. 
Uh, well, here we have again the same question that we had before. It's uh, about self-reporting, yeah. Because you, you want to know this ethnic minority, women and men, who are reporting their access and control of our economic resources. And it's somehow difficult to, to value it's the, the measurement. It's somehow you can maybe check them in a, in a, in a questionnaire to see what the economic resources they had before the project. What do they have now? So you can see the change in the, in the impact, but there is always some bias about self-reporting, but it's, it's sometimes not bad. It can also be, if you do it in a way with interviews and focus group discussions to try to, to get the, the view of the people and to, but to, to put it in numbers and figures, it's, and to see the track changes that it's a little bit not appropriate, I think, yeah. You yeah, can, you can maybe track their incomes. Yeah, you can track their incomes right. against a non-project group of women and men to see if they have really increased their incomes before, yeah. Exactly, yeah. Uh, now, to be fair to Care Canada, the outcome is increased participation, but they, but, and that's difficult to measure, but they've said they're going to, claim that their project is going to increase the levels of a participation for these women, and they're going to train them in some way that this is going to happen through a variety of project services that are described in part one. But yes, it's difficult. But yeah, you could just cut to the chase and figure out, because you want to achieve ultimately increased incomes, economic resources for, for the family, although we can't assume that all that money increased income goes into the women's pocket it may still be held by the husband. And that is understandable. That's why they talk about empowerment of the women specifically. So it's difficult, but I think we've noted it's a challenge for sure in measuring increased participation. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. It's a general hard aspect. Participation is generally very difficult in developing projects. So very often you use the quantitative approaches, yeah, because quantitative, you can work with sur with a questionnaire and uh, make a survey yeah, if you have a, a reliable sample, but it's not always giving you the, the right view yet. Yeah. Right. Okay, good. So the next outcome is enhanced promotion of economic rights for poor rural women, especially ethnic minority women in Vietnam. And the indicator I'm looking at here is Average total number and proportion of daily hours spent on unpaid domestic and care work. Now, this is an interesting one because they are trying to have these women, part of the project actually delivers child care saving options, and they don't describe the options. But we can assume that just by delivering that service in the project, which is very important, it will reduce the, the hours that these women spend on unpaid domestic care work just by providing these alternate options for them to choose, which is fine. Two problems again. The one is, even if that happens, we need to see a comparison group where there's another group of women who don't receive these alternate options of other people taking care of their children, for example, in this project. In another part of the country where another group of women get together, for example, and set up their own community child care center where one woman says, they, all your children can come to my house this day and the rest of you can do what you have to do during the day. And I'll take, and they do that on a rotational basis. So that's the first problem. The other problem is the, when you look at the outcome, again, they're, they're looking at enhanced promotion of economic rights for poor rural women. So this particular indicator isn't promoting their rights specifically. So enhanced promotion is not really being measured here directly. So I, that's the only way I could look at this is saying that, is there another group out there that are also promoting the economic rights of these women in a way that's having the same benefits? So it's, it, there's no comparison group. So that's the problem there with that indicator. Now, to be fair to them, they have other indicators where they are trying to measure enhanced promotion, but we're not
going to discuss that right now because we have limited time to cover all the indicators. But the summary is there for people to look at as to why all of the outcome indicators do fall into one of those five problem areas that we're discussing. So the next one, the next outcome is improve economic well-being for poor rural women, especially ethnic minority women in Vietnam. And the indicator there is percent and number of poor rural and ethnic minority women and men who report an improvement in their economic well-being. And it's the same issue we've talked about before, which is instead of having them self-report on their economic well-being, why not just measure their incomes? And in more importantly, do it compared to another group of women in another part of Vietnam that aren't receiving all these project services and track their incomes before, during, and after the project and see if, if there is a significant increase or greater increase in incomes for the project group. So now that we've done that, we've covered all nine outcomes of the project and picked at least nine outcome indicators. Let's, I think Mark, thank you. You've already covered the other indicator for that outcome, but we'll just do one more. And that is, we'll go back to increased entrepreneurship capacity of women-led grassroots social enterprises to pursue economic opportunities in Vietnam. And we'll look at another indicator. Donald's going to look at 1230.2. Yes, thanks, David. Yeah, 1230.2, this indicator states, percent and number of ethnic minority women led grassroots enterprise members who report a change. And here they're using a five-point scale in their confidence level of their entrepreneurship capacity. This has the same issues as the 1230.1 that we discussed are issues in relate to increased capacity, how that's being de defined. Issues with self-reporting, the reliance of, of it being self-reporting. And the major issue I think that I have with this indicate is confidence assessment. You know, to measure confidence and to improve on this indicator, they should probably use, you know, a psychrometrically sound instrument that would differentiate between perceived self-efficacy and overconfidence. And, and these often do not correlate with actual competence. So there are some clear technical issues with this particular indicator. And to improve it, those issues would be need to improve. Oh. Define what is capacity, you know, is it financial, market assessment, operational, and so forth. Address the issue with confidence, competence, and that would clear up the major issues with this particular indicator. Before we make a decision on this performance measurement framework and its ability to support Care Canada in its claim that its project outcomes have been achieved by its project services, I'm going to go again to the last indicator on the last outcome, which is improve economic well-being for poor rural women, especially ethnic minority women in Vietnam. They have one other indicator, which was level of improvement of economic rights as perceived by ethnic minority women. And that's fine. It's a good way to look at, measure their perception levels to see if their perception levels of how they're doing economically, it's obviously subjective. But there's nothing wrong with that. It's not a bad indicator. But again, the problem is there's no comparison group. So there's, we need to get another group of women outside of the project, some other part of the country in Vietnam, and measure also at the same time their perceived levels of economic well-being where the project's not operating. And if this project wants to claim that they're more successful, then they have to show that their levels of perceived economic well-being have increased at a greater rate or are significantly greater than the non-project group. So now that that's done, what do you think, guys? After we've reviewed this performance measurement framework, do you think that Care Canada can make the claim that its project services are achieving its project outcomes at an expense of $3.4 million to the Canadian taxpayer? Donald? Based on 
they know the analysis that we just provided and the limitations that uh, we identified with the indicators. I, I think it would be extremely difficult for us to to conclusively claim or care Canada for conclusively claim that the program has achieved its objectives. And those are based on key issues we discussed, you know, self-reporting bias, lack of objective measures, no baseline or control groups, measurement frequency issues, vague definitions, and no link to specific activities. Oh. With all these issues, it's it's very difficult to conclusively claim that the program is a Achieve it objectives. Good. Mark? Well, I think in general, I have the, the, the issue is that for me, me, it is not stopping at economic, economic rights. You have also consider social and cultural rights because, in the end of it, it's you want to include them the rights to have ad advocate food, adequate housing, adequate education. Yeah for minority groups and to measure that in this type of project, it seems for me complicated and they in, this inter, it should be interlinked also, like I said before, the economic, social and cultural aspect should be interlinked. And one, one, one point is that, that if I want to see improvement, you have also to talk with the authorities without duty bearers, what they if they are, have measures, have, if they have laws or, or policies that can, can improve life of ethnic majorities in this district or in these places, yeah. Yeah, that's great. Uh, I think I mentioned in part one th that issue where the duty bearers are supposed to advocate for the women, but the bias is they're asked how they believe themselves are doing in that role. And it's not objectively looked at by a third party. And you need to look at that, I think. So that's good. Okay, so we basically summarized that Care Canada needs to do some work on its outcome indicators, for starters, along with a lot of other issues. So what we're going to do now is send this part to, to the Minister for International Development in Canada, as well as the shadow critics for the Conservative Party and the New Democratic Party. And we'll also copy Care Canada. And for you listeners out there, uh, send me an email at evaluatecanadaaid at gmail.com if you want a copy of the performance measurement framework and a copy of the uh, Excel summary of all the outcome indicators and why they fall into one of these five problem areas. Uh, we're also looking for evaluation experts who may want to be interested in doing similar work to what Donald and Mark have done today. Send me an email, and I'd be happy to send you other performance measurement frameworks that I'm looking at for future podcast episodes. And if you have any comments or suggestions on this particular episode regarding Care Canada and our review of their performance measurement framework, send me an email, and I'd be happy to respond. And at some point, we'll be putting the performance measurement frameworks and the summaries of their outcome indicators on a website. And finally, for you listeners, Canadian taxpayers, you may want to uh, email uh, Care Canada at info at care.ca and simply ask them, are they going to be improving their outcome indicators? Or you could also ask them if they're going to put all their other project performance measurement frameworks on their website so that we can all have a look. Because right now they're not available to the public. So thank you for listening. And stay tuned for an upcoming new international development organization, $37 million project. So it's getting a little heavier. Thank you, Donald. And thank you, Mark. Thanks, David. You're welcome, David. All right. Thanks and stay tuned. Bye for now.